Welcome to the Diet Doctor Podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to be joined by Dr. Jason Fung from the IDM program. Now, Jason has been revolutionary in his use of intermittent fasting to treat obesity and to treat diabetes. And in this discussion, we cover a lot of that, but we take it a little bit further and you get to hear Jason's perspective about how other diseases such as cancer, polycystic ovary syndrome, and even little hints at longevity, how they can all be related to a similar process of too much insulin. And we talk about where the levels of evidence exist for this and how we can kind of approach patients both with and without the evidence. So I hope there's a lot of take-home messages that you can t- that you can take away from this interview to see how you can implement them in your lives if you're su- suffering from any of these issues, but also how to sort of reframe this issue of insulin, its impact on our lives and our health, and how we can implement fasting as a way to approach that. Now, to be fair, fasting means a lot of different things to different people. So we talk about the definitions and we talk about ways to make sure it's done safely because that's very important. Just because something's good doesn't mean more of it's better. And I think that's an important take home with fasting as well. Doing it under supervision, doing it safely can have a positive impact. And that's part of what Jason has devoted a a big portion of his career to. Now, he's still a practicing nephrologist, and that's sort of where all this started. Um, But now with IDM program, he is reaching so many more people and spreading the word more about the benefits of intermittent fasting. So enjoy this interview with Dr. Jason Fung. And if you want to learn more, you can get the transcripts and see all our prior episodes on dietdoctor.com. Dr. Jason Fung, thanks so much for joining me on the Diet Doctor podcast. Oh, great to be here, finally. (laughs) (laughs) It's great to have you. So we already had Megan Ramos, who worked with you at IDM program, and talked about the amazing work that you and she and your whole team are doing, implementing fasting as a tool for metabolic health and reversing diabetes and weight loss. But it's not without its controversy, is it? No, I mean, I think it's because... It's really not been um, standard for the last sort of 20 to 30 years. Prior to that, people didn't care much, right? But, you know, in the last 30 years, everybody thought we had to eat, had to eat, had to eat to lose weight and, you know, all this other stuff. So it has been controversial and mostly because it goes against the grain. I mean, when I first thought about fasting, I thought it was a bad idea too, right? And and you hear so much like, oh, it's going to burn muscle, it's going to wreck your metabolism and don't skip breakfast and all these sort of things that make it sound really scary until you realize that people have been doing it for like thousands of years. Right. And when you talk about fasting, I mean, I think the definition is really important because some people get in their minds 10 day, 15 day, these prolonged fasts, but then really it's, it's, it's mostly shorter fasts that you're using in your program, isn't that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in the 60s, for example, when people were doing all these um, studies, they would be doing like 30 to 60 days of fasting. And you got to remember, these are not like obese people. <laughs> these right. are people that had, you know, very low body fast because there just wasn't that much obesity and they're going on 60 days of fasting. It's like, okay, that's not a very good idea, right? And and that's where people got into trouble. Like they, they shouldn't have been fasting, but they did it for some study. I mean, I look at some of these studies they did and they're incredible. Like uh, one of them, for example, uh, they had like, I think they had nine people or something like that. And they fasted them for like 30 or 60 days. Then they gave them a big whack of insulin. Oh, geez. It's like, uh, and I'm thinking, why did they do that? And when the answer was like, just to see what would happen sort of thing, right? So they, they dropped the sugars to like very low, I think in, in, in um, it was like one point something in, in the Canadian unit. So it's like probably like 30 or something like that. It's wow. something ridiculously low. Yeah. And everybody was completely asymptomatic. So, you know, these are the kind of studies no one would ever do now, right? You don't do that kind of thing. And that's, uh, you know, you don't have to take those sort of risks. So that's where people go more towards the shorter fast and there's no reason not to do them. And, you know, you got to understand that fasting is sort of a part of the normal life. Like that's where the word breakfast comes in. You're supposed to feed, then you're supposed to fast. And it's like, what's wrong with that, right? You have a word that tells you that it's actually part of your daily schedule. And now, you know, fasting for 12 hours is like insane. It's like, you know, that everybody in the seventies did it. Right. Like, 
without even thinking about it. So it, 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 it's sort of come all the way around that, oh, you shouldn't even go like more than two hours without eating. It's like, okay, well, what about you know, the normal nightly fast, right? Yeah. It's, um, and, and that's what makes interpreting the science of fasting sort of difficult because depending on how you define it is going to d- depend on how you interpret the science. So uh, you and the folks at your program recently just published three case studies of some remarkable benefits um, with fasting, with people getting off their insulin and reversing their diabetes within days um, with fasting. But it was it was an alternate day fasting, so never more than a 24-hour fast in, in those three patients. Is that right? Yeah, so yeah. this is stunning. Um, so all three uh, people, middle-aged, they had sort of between 20 and 25 years of type 2 diabetes, most of them five-plus years on insulin and big doses, like 60 units sort of thing. And it took a maximum of 18 days to get off of all their insulin. A maximum of 18 days. That's incredible. It was ridiculous how quickly they got better. And the schedule we used, because we had to protocolize it somewhat, is 24 hours fasting three times a week. So this is the thing, is that within uh, you know less than a month, they had significantly reversed their type 2 diabetes. Even a year later, I think... Uh, two of them are off all meds and non-diabetic by by the classifications, uh, you know, by A one C. And one of them, I think, was on some metformin still, but came off all the insulin and three out of the four medications or something. So doing ridiculously well for an intervention that is actually free, available to anybody, and has been used for thousands of years. So it's, yeah. it's sort of ridiculous how quickly some people can get better. And uh, you know, as I was. Um, uh, saying it's like uh, this is something that really need people need to understand because it causes so much disease, type two diabetes. I mean, twenty years of diabetes, and we had just proved that that was all completely unnecessary. Like, do you know the amount of damage they right. did to their bodies with twenty years of type two diabetes? Yeah. Uh, to their hearts and to their kidneys and to their eyes. And it was all and, completely preventable. Uh, exactly. Like yeah. in a month, they could have taken care of the whole thing. Now, in this case series, they were following a low-carb diet in addition to the intermittent fasting. So do you find the success um, varies with low-carb and without low-carb when you're instituting intermittent fasting? Yeah, for sure. We recommend low-carbohydrate diets for all of um, the, the, the type 2 diabetics. And it, it's really along the same lines. I think type 2 diabetes is largely a disease of hyperinsulinemia. So therefore, both low carbohydrate diets and intermittent fasting, the goal is to lower insulin. As, as, as you lower insulin in a disease of too much insulin, you're going to get better, just like PCOS. If it's too much insulin, you got to lower it, right? right? With type 1 diabetes, if you don't have insulin, you got to give it. That's how you're going to get better. So it's like, it's not that insulin is evil or anything like that, right? It's just all context. Like if you're if it's too high, you got to bring it down. If it's too low, you got to bring it up, right? And that's how you're going to get better. Yeah, very simple perspective, but somehow it gets a lot, confu- <laughs> lot more confusing for a yeah. lot of people. They just need to realize the perspective there. So the, the, the concerns about fasting are the safety of it. So one being um, your resting metabolic rate. Is it going to go down with fasting? And again, time frame matters, doesn't it? Yeah, for sure. And um, if you're... You know, if you're looking at some of the studies now, so nobody does these 60-day fasts sort of and studies it, but there's been a few studies of um, alternate day fasting, and a lot of these are not sort of true fasts, so you have to extrapolate somewhat, but the the ones that do measure resting metabolic rate don't show any significant difference from chronic calorie restriction. In fact, most of the studies, and there's a number of them, so you have to kind of pick which one you choose, but uh, most of them show that there's less of this drop in metabolic rate with alternate daily fasting. In some studies, for example, one study where they did the for straight days of fasting, their metabolic rate was actually 10% higher at the end of the four days compared to the day zero. And again, it all comes down to physiology because, you know, I don't know why people get so bent out of shape. Like, so if you don't eat, insulin drops, okay? We know that. That's for sure happens. And when insulin drops, the counter-regulatory hormones go up. 
We know that. That's why they're called counter-regulatory hormones. They go counter of insulin. And one of the big ones is sympathetic tone. Like that's not for debate, right? That's so sympathetic tone, you mean adrenaline and adre- no adrenaline, and adrenaline. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's the basically the fight or flight response. So okay. if you see a lion, your sympathetic uh, tone goes way up and you either prepare to fight or run really, really fast. So your body actually increases growth hormone, sympathetic tone, or adrenaline to actually bring glucose into the blood, right? It floods the body with glucose that you can use to run away. That's medical school physiology. Okay, so if you think, and cortisol too, so cortisol is one of the counter-regulatory hormones, but if you think about it, okay, if sympathetic tone is going up, you know, you're activating your body, that's what sympathetic is, parasympathetic, you're toning it down, but you're activating the body, what do you think that's going to do to your energy? It's going to raise your energy, it's going to increase your metabolic rate, it's like, come on. This is medical school stuff. Like, why is this a debate? And all the studies show that there's probably less effect on the the um, basal metabolic rate from sort of real world studies on alternate day fasting and stuff. Yeah. Um, most of them allow calories and so on. So they're, 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 you have to interpret them a bit. But, you know, come on. It's like, why do we worry about this? Where did this notion even come from? Because it actually, if you fast, you're going to decrease your metabolic rate. That actually runs counter to what we all learned in medical school of what happens when you don't eat. With a one to three day fast, at least. We can say that with pretty yeah, certainty. Yeah. If, if yeah. you're going 30 days and 60 days, yeah, you're talking about something totally different and right. almost nobody does that. Like we generally don't recommend that either. I mean, uh, for us, we're like, why take the risk? So if you're doing 30 days, if you want to, it's great. But if you don't, if, if you look at it, it's, it's more powerful, but there's more risk. So why don't you just do more shorter fast? And that's the sort of trend towards where we've gone. So in the 60s, everybody was like, oh, fasting is like a month, right? And it's like, okay, fasting nowadays, like 16 hours is controversial, right? Yeah, it's amazing how times change. Yeah. yeah, and so the other big concern is lean body mass loss, muscle loss, um, nitrogen wasting, and depending on how you measure it, it seems like you can come up with different conclusions. Yeah, so again, you can definitely measure, you know, nitrogen waste, right? And then you have to say, well, is it muscle or is it not muscle? Because not yeah. all protein is muscle, right? So, so actually, I should clarify: nitrogen waste meaning measuring the nitrogen sort of in the urine that you that you urinate out, and then the question is, where did that nitrogen come from in the body? Right, yeah. right. And I think it depends a little bit on what your perspective is. So if you're talking about elite athletes, then yeah, you're talking about something totally different than what I'm talking about for the most part, which is sort of middle-aged and elderly people who are mostly obese. So there's a lot of excess protein sitting there. So if you look at, again, we're not talking elite athletics, but if you're measuring it, there's been studies and they say that obese people generally have about 20 to 50% more protein than a normal person. And that's all skin, that's all connective tissue, right? There's a lot of skin. When you look at those programs where they have those skin surgeries, they're taking out like 40 pounds of skin, right? That's not fat, that's Mm -hmm. protein. So there is excess protein when you're talking in that specific uh, sort of obesity type 2 diabetes uh, situation. And you have to think that the body is going to maybe use some of that because that's all protein that needs to go. So, and again, if you look at the studies um, that have compared intermittent energy restriction, so IER versus CR, which is chronic restriction, and there's been a few, most of them generally show that there's less loss of lean mass and as a percentage. So one study um, from 2016 uh, that was published in Obesity, for example, shows that, you know, uh, you get about 0.5 increase in percentage of lean mass because people are losing weight with chronic calorie restriction, but it it goes up by 2.2% in intermittent energy restriction or fasting. So in fact, you're preserving lean mass much better if you're using the fasting strategy, but this is sort of short-term 24 hours or less Mm -hmm. uh, strategies. So again, um, again, if, if you think about it, it's like, okay, if you think that the body is, when it has no food, it's going to bypass your, you know, excess protein like skin connective tissue and go right for your heart muscle. It's like, you must think that the body's really, really stupid, right? 
Like, honestly, like you don't eat for 24 hours. Oh, you're going to start breaking down your diaphragm. Like, why would the body do that? Like, you know, <laughs> muscle is a muscle, basically. So it, how does it know to target certain muscles and not others? It exactly, wouldn't. Exactly, it yeah. wouldn't. It's going to go for the stuff that's not needed. Um, and how would we have survived if our body was so incredibly stupid that every time you don't eat, it starts breaking down your muscle? Like, yeah. let's think about this for a, se a second. Like, I do fairly regular fasting. So if I'm losing like a quarter of a pound of muscle every time I, um, you know, fast for 24 hours, it's like... Yeah, I should have like zero muscle right now, right? I should be this giant blob of fat. Right. Instead, I'm pretty much the same, you know, composition as I was a couple of years ago when I didn't fast, right? It, it just didn't make any difference. Do you recommend resistance training to try and stimulate muscle growth or maintain muscle during the fast? Or do you think even that's not necessary? Um, I think it's always good to do it, yeah. um, uh, no doubt. But the thing about it is that the body is like... Honestly, the body is incredibly smart. So if you put a strain on the system, it will respond by getting stronger. So muscles work like that, right? So you put a little bit of damage on your muscles, it rebuilds it to get stronger. You put um, weight on the bones and they respond by getting stronger. So if you, uh, you know, look at astronauts, you take away gravity and all mm. of a sudden, hey, their bones deteriorate like crazy, their right. muscles deteriorate like crazy. You put a, a, a man, hospitalize him and put him in bed rest only, which was, remember, the old uh, treatment they treated for heart attacks. Hours, yeah. Yeah, five days of bed rest. Right. Um, what you do is you take the strain off the muscle, so you take the stress off and you immediately start losing muscle. So if you want to lose muscle, that is the way to lose muscle, yeah. sit in bed all day. Like why would the eating have anything to do with it? Eating doesn't make you gain muscle, right? Otherwise we'd all be a nation of like, you know, Arnold Schwarzeneggers, right? It doesn't happen. They're two totally separate things, right? You build muscle because you are working it, then you lose muscle because you aren't working it. Yeah. Uh, if you're working it and not eating, your body is going to come up with a way to build that muscle. That's just the way it is, right? right? Otherwise, uh, again, if you look at these, n these Native uh, Americans and all these people who used to go through these feast and famine cycles, right? And it's like they were not little globs of fat running around the prairies, right, when the pioneers came. They were lean and muscular and, you know, uh, strong right. because your body responds to that. And, and I think it's, it's really silly to think that our body is just so maladapted to life. <laughs> Interesting perspective, right? That the body knows and we just have to listen uh, yeah, and help absolutely. it on its way. Yeah. yeah. And then there are obviously a number of other issues about making sure you're well hydrated and have adequate sodium intake and, you know, uh, reduce medications if necessary. And I think that's a big issue of doing this on your own versus doing it with professional guidance. So yeah, yeah tell us some your perspective on that and some yeah, of the things you're sure. doing to help with that. So yeah, that's, that's our um, IDM program and it's basically to provide the education people need because it's not easy. I mean, it's, it works, but it's not easy. It's not fun, right? I'd rather be eating donuts myself, <laughs> but it's healthy. And that's the thing is that it is something that will improve your health. So you need to get educated as to what to expect. So if you know that, for example, headaches are very common, but they'll go away, then you can deal with it. Yeah. If you know that you're going to get hungry and there are tips that might help you uh, deal with that hunger, then that's going to help you in terms of the fasting. So it's about getting the proper education and that's what we provide with our IDM program and also providing a supportive community. And that is really sort of the secret behind a lot of um, things, not just for weight loss, like Weight Watchers, for example, they started out not with a diet, but with uh, those meetings, right? The Weight Watchers meetings, and that's the secret sauce, right? Same for Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not like, um, you know, they didn't know to, hey, stop drinking. It was that you had a supportive group. You had a sponsor yeah. and you had a thing. So so doing it with a, a community is just way easier. And that's a secret of how all these communities used to fast. You do Ramadan. Hey, everybody's fasting. Hey, it's Lent. It's everybody's fasting. Hey, it's Yom Kippur. Everybody's fasting. So it's it's not fun, but it's it's not as hard as it it 
would otherwise be. Because right. if you're trying to fast and everybody's telling you you're stupid and, and eating like, you know, in front of you, it's like, that's not the easiest thing to do. So don't, you know, you got to set yourself up for success. And that's what we hope to do with, with the IDM program. Yeah, that's a great point. And there are a lot of of communities built around fasting that are sort of popping up so people can support themselves. Yeah. yeah I think that's valuable. Now, with fasting, you can look at it from two perspectives um, in terms of what are you treating. And one is treating diabetes and obesity and insulin resistance. And another is just promoting longevity. And that's a whole other field of research, which now with your book, The Longevity Solution, you're, it seems like you've for, sort of delved more into longevity. So tell us a little bit how the mindset changes when you're, when you're focusing on longevity rather than just treating or reversing a medical condition. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's really a matter of how to sort of maintain health throughout uh, life. And so we looked in this book on a lot of sort of ancient wellness practices because I'm not about selling the latest supplement that's going to make you live forever, right? I, I don't think that exists. Yeah. Um, but there are certain um, practices that have sort of withstood the test of time. That is, they were considered to be wellness practices 2,000 years ago, and I think that has merit because those practices have kind of um, sort of uh, withstood the crucible of time. Like if, if something's really bad for you and people do it, they'll like die out, right? So the, the fact that these practices or these foods or whatever have survived means that they're probably is something. And what's interesting is that the science is starting to catch up and fasting is one of these things. So if you look at the science of longevity, the, the one thing that really stands out huge is calorie restriction. So that is probably the single most well-studied mechanism for uh, longevity and in animal studies uh, mostly. Um, but intermittent fasting is sort of a play on that in that it is a way to restrict overall calories and maybe there's a better way to do it, but at least it's been used for a long time as opposed to sort of protein restriction or carbohydrate restriction. Those have not been used for as long. So intermittent fasting is a way to do that. And the physiology is that, uh, you know, a lot of these growth... Um, factors are also nutrient sensors. And I think this is actually a really interesting uh, thing. So if you look at the theories of aging, of why we age, or um, there's sort of this trade-off between growth and longevity. Okay. So if you look at a car, for example, if you rev its engine, you can get high performance out of it, but it's not going to last very long because it's going to burn out. And it's the same thing. If your body is always growing, 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 growing like crazy, it probably does the same thing. It burns out quicker. So the growth program is probably at odds with the longevity program because it's probably the same program. And as part of that, when you're triggering growth or stimulating growth, you're going to grow the healthy cells, but you're also not going to be able to just limit it to, to the healthy cells. So potential cancer cell growth or abnormal cell growth to lead to chronic disease. So exactly. we can't necessarily differentiate it. Exactly, because they're part and parcel of the same thing. Yeah. And when you look at the growth pathways, for example, you have something like IGF-1, which is insulin-like growth factor 1. And so insulin and both, both insulin and insulin-like growth factor 1 are very similar and they're growth hormones. So you can look at a population of Ecuadorian dwarves, for example, called the Laron dwarves. And what was super fascinating is that this group of dwarves, which uh, they're persecuted from Spain, the Inquisition forced them into Ecuador. And of course, there's this founder effect where uh, because there's only a few of these dwarves and they all married each other, or the, the small population, they all, a lot of these, uh, this dwarfism occurred. And a few years ago, it was uh, when they're following these dwarves, they realized, hey, these guys actually don't get cancer really? and they don't get diabetes either. And then they, and they're like, what's the difference between this dwarf and the other one? And it's like, they have no IGF one. They just, mm. and it's like, wow. So here's a, you know, here's a, the thing is that if you slow down the growth program, 
then you might be able to age better. So it all depends also on what stage of life. So if you're a child, if you're an adolescent, you you want that growth program running. Right. Growth isn't by its definition bad. We need exactly. to grow. We need to build muscle. That's part of health as well. So it's exactly finding the balance, which can be tricky. Yeah. But if you're going now for longevity, so if your average age of like, um, you know, if you're like in the middle ages or whatever, your average age is 30, then yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, run that as hard as you want. It don't matter because you're going to die of like the black death or something, right? right. <laughs> so it's like, it doesn't matter. But now if you're trying to get out to like 80, 90 years mm -hmm. old, you have to be a bit smart. So just like that engine, you can't run it full speed. You got to cut back at some point. So if you look at the, um, what stimulates growth the most, it's things like insulin, insulin, like growth factor, mTOR, and AMPK, which are all nutrient sensors. And this is what's really interesting is that the nutrient sensing pathways are actually the same growth pathways because the body has to know whether nutrients are available. Right. If so nutrients, nutrient sensors, meaning they're turned on or inhibited just by having nutrients in your body. Exactly. So if you have like, you know, a... Um, um, an ovary, for example, it's way on the inside. How is it supposed to know if there's food coming in? Well, it knows it because when you eat, insulin goes up. And when you have um, protein, mTOR goes up, for example. And if you eat fat, uh, AMPK is also uh, goes down. So those are nutrient sensors because it's the body's way of sensing if nutrients are available. Mm -hmm. And they are actually the exact same ones as growth. So now if you want to say, okay, well, this growth pathway after, you know, age 30 or whatever, I don't really want to go full bore on growth because I want to live to 80. If you want now longevity, you actually have to cut down your growth pathway, which means reducing those nutrient sensing pathways, which is insulin, which is mTOR, which is AMPK. And of course, that's yeah. something that fasting does. And So the question always is, where is the threshold for this, right? Because again, chronic calorie restriction can sort of lower the stimulation of it. But you know, the old saying, it may not make you live longer, but it sure makes life feel longer, right? <laughs> it's not as enjoyable to do. Yeah. So with the intermittent calorie restriction or intermittent fasting, where's that threshold and how do we know? Because we can't necessarily measure mTOR and AMP kinase and it's harder to measure. So we have to use surrogate markers. So what do you use as your guidelines to say, here is where you're getting the biggest bang for your buck to do this level of fasting to help promote your longevity? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it really comes down to maintaining a sort of stable body weight and making sure you don't have the visceral obesity. Because the one thing we know, of course, is that the metabolic syndrome is going to shorten your life, right? It's going to give you heart attacks. It's going to give you all kinds of stuff, cancer and so on. And that's dependent on not body weight, but uh, waist circumference, you know, type 2 diabetes and hypertriglyceridemia and all that sort of thing. So we know that those are all very important. And those are obviously highly linked into hyperinsulinemia and so on. So if you're looking for a surrogate marker that's been clearly uh, correlated to disease and that's going to affect longevity, it's all those things. So if you're fasting and your weight is just way, 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 you know, down, then yeah, you probably don't need to be doing that. But on the other hand, doing it every so often might be something that's very beneficial. And again, if you look at it, it's like there's that sort of ancient wellness practice that people have done for thousands of years. Once a year, do a longer fast just to sort of clean everything out, reset everything, and mm -hmm. then go from there. Do you need to do it longer? Maybe not. But if you're 300 pounds and have type 2 diabetes, you probably need to be doing more because you know that those insulin growth pathways are way, way too high. It's harder for mTOR, right? And that's really the tough part. And we spend a lot of time talking about sort of optimal protein and stuff, but that's really, really hard to measure because it's not as easy to see. Yeah. For something that's so hard to measure, mTOR sure gets a lot of airtime and a lot of discussion. Yeah. <laughs> and it is pretty controversial because we need it to grow. We need it for immune function, but yet we can't have, we shouldn't have it turned on all the time. And part of that concern is cancer. So this is another field that you've been fairly vocal about, about fasting and insulin uh, as it relates to cancer. 
Um, yeah. And that, that can be controversial as well because cancer, there's the one theory that it's all sort of a genetic mutation and, you know, the drugs we're developing are these high-powered weapons, so to speak, to, to target specific genetic variations of cancer. And then there's the sort of the opposite side saying, no, it's more of a metabolic disease or maybe it's a combination of the both. So how do you incorporate that into your thinking and fasting in terms of cancer prevention or treatment? Yeah. And the, I think that the cancer is like a fascinating story because for, you know, since I was in medical school, we all talked about genetics. It was all a genetic disease, right? It's just genetics, genetics, genetics. It's a mutation. It's genetic mutations. If we can find the mutation and block it, we're going to cure cancer. Of course, that didn't happen, right? So we got the Human Genome Project was going to cure cancer. And then he had the Cancer Genome Atlas, which was an even more ambitious um, um, attempt to find out, you know, the mutations of cancer because we thought there was one or two mutations. Turns out there's like hundreds of mutations and not only mutations like between people. So one breast cancer cell to the next uh, person's breast cancers might have like 100 mutations and 100 completely different mutations on the other guy. But even within the same tumor, there are different mutations. So mm -hmm. there is mutations everywhere. And clearly you're not going to develop 100 medications to block every single, 100 different drugs to block every single mutation. So that was sort of a dead end theory. And the other thing is that it's, it's not about genetics, but it's about the interaction action of genetics and the environment, then we sort of forgot that it depends on the environment. So looking at obesity, for example, the World Health Organization lists 13 uh, cancers as obesity related, right? And including breast cancer and colorectal cancer, sort of the number two and number three cancers after lung. Which doesn't mean that obesity causes these cancers, but, no, but it plays a role. Plays a role and right. makes it more likely. So sort of yeah. the, uh, if you have a genetic mutation and you're obese, now the deck is really stacked against you. Exactly. So. But now there's something you can do about it yeah. because if you have a genetic mutation, Eh, there's nothing you can do about it. You have it. Like, I'm not going to change it. If you have it, you have it. I can't do anything about it. But I can change the environment in which that cancer cell lies because we know it's vitally important. So you take a Japanese woman in Japan and you move her to Hawaii and then San Francisco, the rate of breast cancer like triples. Right. even though the genetics are exactly the same. So what's the difference? The difference is clearly the diet and the environment in which that breast cancer cell is living. So again, what is going to stimulate breast cancer cells to grow? And in the lab, the answer is very clear. Insulin is what breast cancer cells need. You can't barely grow breast cancer cells in a, in a, in a dish without insulin. If you take away the insulin, they all like die, right? Yeah. And if you give them lots of insulin, they grow because the nutrient sensing pathways are the same as the growth pathways. So you take this breast cancer cell and remember, the obesity didn't, didn't cause the cancer, right? The, but after that cancer cell is there, you're going to stimulate it to grow if you have a lot of insulin. So that so type 2 diabetes, a disease of hyperinsulinemia, higher risk of cancer. Obesity, disease of hyperinsulinemia, higher risk of cancer. And then you say, okay, what about the other ones? What about AMPK, for example? What blocks AMPK or what affects AMPK? Metformin. It's like, oh, well, you know that metformin in a lot of studies has been associated with a significantly decreased rate of breast cancer. It's like, is it the effect on AMPK? It's a very interesting hypothesis. What about mTOR? It's like, because those are the three main nutrient sensing pathways. Well, mTOR, you can block mTOR with rapamycin. And guess what? It is an anti-cancer medication. Right? Why? Right. Because you're blocking the pathway. So rapamycin is super, super interesting because it blocks mTOR, right? So it's developed as an immune suppressing drug. And the thing about immune suppressants is they generally increase the rate of cancer because the immune system sort of destroys cancer on site. Right. So if you give a drug that suppresses the immune system, like these transplant patients, you give tons of drugs to suppress the immune system, cancer goes crazy. And that's and infections. why. Infections, absolutely. Yeah. But 
sort of unique amongst these immunosuppressants, cancers went down. It's like, wow. That the is, specific one with rapamycin. With rapamycin. Right. Yeah, it's like fascinating because you're blocking mTOR. So because you're blocking growth pathways, you don't have the, uh, uh, you know, that's why it blocks the immune system, but it also blocks cancer because it, it very specifically targets this nutrient sensing growth yeah. pathway, which are the same thing, which is now amenable by the diet. It's like, yeah. wow. So it's a fascinating field. And, and one of the things that's important though, is to talk about the level of evidence of support. So what you've been talking about is a mechanistic level of evidence of support. And with the uh, Japanese women moving to the United States, uh, sort of the epidemiological or observational. So we don't know it was the diet. We know it was an environmental change yeah, and the yeah, diet's a big right. part of that. And the mechanisms you're describing certainly make sense. So it all seems to fit, but yet we don't quite have those human trials to say, yes, it works, which can that make it a little uncomfortable for you to recommend uh, fasting for, for that? Re- oh yeah, um, for sure. Field? For sure. Because yeah. you don't know what the effect is, but you know that for example, if you use fasting to reduce obesity, you're likely going to have a beneficial effect. But you can't say that for sure. Like, and the other thing is that where this is prevention, right? So this is you're talking. Um, you don't know if you're you don't know if you're going to prevent it because you don't know if somebody's going to get it or not. And you're right. not doing those big trials that are going to say, well, we fasted sort of a million women and a million didn't and you know, this is what happened. Those trials don't exist. So now you're talking about going into treatment and that's a, you know, a totally different uh, thing. One, I don't think that there's much data whatsoever, but there is some super interesting data about sort of combination therapy, right? So you say, okay, well, diet is not going to cut it for treatment. Like you can't have breast cancer and just think you're going to fast. And, you know, yes, there's a few case reports and so on, for, but for the most part, that is not going to work for most people. But can you combine it with, say, chemotherapy to to uh, make it better? And that's something that's, you know, really, really fascinating because, for example, fasting it reduces the side effects of chemotherapy. We know that because chemotherapy, and there's been a couple of um, papers on that, the chemotherapy affects the uh, most rapidly dividing cells. So in in the human body, the normal body, the cancer cells are growing fast, so that's why you're targeting rapidly growing cells, but the hair follicles grow quickly. The, the, the epithelial cells of the intestinal system, for example, are very rapidly growing. So therefore you get nausea, vomiting, and hair loss. So, so if you put these... If you now fast 48 hours, for example, and you get these cells to ramp down their growth, they will enter sort of a more quiescent state. Now you whack them with big doses of chemotherapy, you're going to get less side effects. So if you get less side effects, one, you're going to be able to, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, treatments have to be ramped back because of too many side effects. So you can right. get the full treatment or maybe you can get a higher dose treatment because you're looking for this maximal tolerated dose, right? And then there's some interesting data to suggest that maybe that, um, you know, so so the worry, of course, is that the cancer cells will also <laughs> go into this sort of protective state. But apparently there's some preliminary data that suggests that doesn't happen because they're stuck in this sort of on mode, right? That's the whole point of cancer, that they're in this right. sort of growth mode. They and don't they have the stop. normal feedback loops. So yeah, they sort exactly. of bypass that. So yeah. for prevention, you might be able to do something about it. But for treatment, maybe you can combine it. And then, of course, they talk about combining a ketogenic diet with drugs, for example. Is that going to be beneficial? So they do these things. So the, the PI3K pathway is actually the growth pathway. And they have drugs that can block it and they say, well, what if you downregulate insulin by eating a ketogenic diet and then give the drug? Like, can you do better than doing either one alone? And those studies are very interesting, but there's not a lot of data. So cancer yeah. is more of an evolving story that I think we really, you know, would be, you know, it's it's super interesting. But Yeah, <laughs> safe to say it's in its infancy, but shows promise. And so exactly. maybe in the next five to 10 years, we're going to have a completely different discussion and say, yes, here's what the evidence shows yeah. um, one yeah. way or the other. But uh, the, the one thing you know for sure is that in the prevention, if you can prevent the obesity and you can prevent the type 2 diabetes, 
there's a good chance that you're going to prevent some of these diseases. So remember, colorectal and uh, breast cancer are the big ones in terms of obesity-related cancers because they've already been declared obesity-related cancers, right? So um, with the idea that, hey, reducing obesity is going to reduce um, the, the breast cancer, for example. Yeah, certainly makes sense. So, so now transitioning from longevity and cancer to procreation, and so you gave a talk today about PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. And, you know, you're a nephrologist, right? So you even <laughs> mentioned, what is a kidney doctor doing talking about the ovaries? So draw, draw the line, connect the dots for us. <laughs> yeah, and I was saying that I'm not, I wasn't very interested in the whole uh, disease until a few years ago when we started really uh, treating people. And um, Nadia, uh, who works with us at the IDM program, she's one of the educators. She was like, well, you know, all these women are getting pregnant. There's like 15, 20 women who have gotten pregnant. I'm like, whoa, that is really interesting. And, and we've always known that PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, is related to obesity and the insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. So it, it, it was sort of part of that whole um, a metabolic syndrome sort of um, spectrum that I had been talking about, but I hadn't really looked that closely into it. So then I, you know, as I, as I uh, got interested, I said, okay, let's look at what happens with um, with it? Let's look at the pathophysiology. Why are people getting PCOS? And it's been well worked out. And I showed a New England Journal of Medicine review article that sort of spells it all out. So you get um, under the influence of too much insulin, your ovaries actually start to produce a lot of testosterone. And when you have a lot of uh, insulin, the liver decreases um, sex hormone binding globulin. So the effect of the testosterone is increased because there's not a lot of this globulin to bind it. So the free testosterone is more active. So therefore, you get all the symptoms and uh, the, the hair growth, the acne, um, clitoral enlargement, other things that, that, that is sort of very typical. And infertility. Yeah, the infertility comes from the anovulatory cycles. So, you know, if you look at uh, the insulin, what it does is it causes something called follicular arrest. So during the normal menstrual cycle, you have a developing follicle and then the sort of, um, you know, the egg pops out and then it becomes the corpus luteum that, that involutes. That's the normal menstrual cycle. If it doesn't get pregnant, then you get the, the bleeding and the period. So if you have too much insulin, then you get follicular arrest, um, and that means the follicle stops developing at a certain point. So it never ovulates, so it never reaches the size that it's going to ovulate, and if it doesn't ovulate, there's no egg and you can't get pregnant. So that's another, that's the infertility. And the thing is that if it doesn't ovulate, it doesn't become the luteal body, which then involutes, which means that it sort of just gets reabsorbed into the body. So you've stopped the follicular development at a stage where it doesn't ever go away. So you've got these cysts that develop over time. So, okay, so those are the three sort of criteria of PCOS. You've got too much insulin, which causes the follicular arrest, which causes the cyst. You've got too much insulin, which causes the follicular arrest, which causes the anovulatory cycles. And then you've got too much insulin, which causes the hyperandrogenism. So the whole disease is a disease of too much insulin. And it's been well worked out and it was in this review article. So it's like, okay, well, like the if it's too much insulin then bring down the insulin. That's how you're going to make the disease better. That's the root cause. Treat it. Right. Instead, that's not how we treat it. We give drugs we instead. We give drugs. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. Yeah. This is a total replay of like type 2 diabetes. Right. So here you know the cause and you know the answer. The answer is if insulin's too high, you got to drop it. How are you going to do that? Low carbohydrate diets, ketogenic diets, um, intermittent fasting. Instead, we give birth control pills. We use Clomid, which is a, you know, um, causes the ovary to start hyper secreting, and that's like. Okay, that is not the yeah. answer, right? It's like so again, mechanistically makes complete sense. And now the level of evidence, to my understanding, is low carb diets can reverse a lot of the um, 
the hirsutism, the, the hair growth. But I don't know that we have any evidence saying it improves fertility, but yet there's lots of anecdotal evidence of that right. happening. Right. Um, do you think that we're going to bridge that gap so that this will become a more uh, common it treatment? It depends if anybody's interested in yeah. actually looking at it. And no that's drug companies the... <laughs> are interested, that's for sure. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and this is one of the reasons that they use metformin because they use it as a sort of, um, you know, insulin sensitizer, which makes a little bit of sense. So at least that makes a little bit of sense. But, uh, you know, it's, the question is who's who's looking at it like uh, these low carbohydrate diets haven't been you know used for a long time because of the worry about the dietary fat and intermittent fasting hasn't been used i mean when i started talking about it like 6 years ago like i was tr- like really just a lonely voice in the wilderness so nobody but nobody was studying this um so yeah it's are the studies going to come i I hope so. I don't know that there's a lot of people interested in it. But here's the thing, and this is sort of the art of medicine as opposed to the science of medicine. It's like everything in medicine comes down to risk versus reward, okay? So if you give a drug like a beta blocker or you do a stent or something, it's like what's the risk of doing a stent? Because there's risk. Everything has risk. And what's the reward? If the risk is more than the reward, you don't do it. If the reward is better than the risk, then you go ahead and you plop in a stent, right? Or you give aspirin or you give beta blockers or whatever it is. So what's the risk if you don't eat, you know, for 16 hours of the day? What's the cost? Like zero? Like what's the risk? If you're overweight, there's practically no risk. So then you say, okay, well, there's no risk. So any reward you get is a plus. And here's the thing that you don't have to prove. If you're a patient with PCOS, if you're somebody who has PCOS, you don't have to prove that it works in everybody. You only have to prove that it works in yourself. So if you have type 2 diabetes, if you have PCOS or any of these diseases, you can simply say, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it for two months because it's not going to cost me anything. I'm going to do low carbohydrate diets. I'm going to do intermittent fasting and see what happens. If nothing happens and your disease is just as bad as before, then you haven't lost anything. You can go ahead and just do it. But what if your disease completely goes away? Right. Right. Now you've done something which all the drugs haven't been able to do for you. And the thing is that it's big money here, right? So IVF is big money, right? So it's like four plus billion dollars a year. So these people who are doing fertility treatments and all this sort of stuff, like if you ever go into one of those clinics, they're really nice. They look like a spa. Right. But, and it's also miserable for the women. I mean, it is so uncomfortable and difficult to do. And it can all be changed potentially, 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 potentially with nutrition. Yeah, and 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 it's 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 not just the uh, discomfort of the IVF, but it's like if you want a baby, it's like you want a baby. It's like very like it totally like yeah, it's emotional takes, cost. It's a huge emotional cost. Yeah, and the time is ticking because. Uh, people are getting married later. We know that. People are having their babies later, right? So it's funny because, you know, my sister uh, got married at like 22 and had her kids at like 24. And she was like the latest of her, you know, friends, right? It's like nowadays people are getting married at like 35 and having their baby at like 38 or something like that, right? So if you're having your babies at like 35 plus, I mean, that used to be considered sort of low fertility time. Right, that's advanced maternal age. Exactly, because fertility sort of peaks at around 20, right? It's like you can't stop getting pregnant at 18 or yeah. 20, right? But at 35, it's it's not as easy as it was. And so if you're if you're wasting time because you're like saying, oh, you know, I got to wait for the evidence and, you know, I'm going to do cycles of IVF, it's like, well, why not? Like you can do that, but why can't you add it to or just use it instead of? Like yeah. it, it just it, it just makes no sense. And that's that's what I mean. It's like sort of the art of the... The art of medicine, because it's not like, do I have evidence that yeah. it works? No, but... Yeah, it's a good perspective. We, we, we talk a lot about evidence-based medicine, and that is important to understand the quality of the evidence, especially when there's a risk to the treatment, like you're saying. So I think that was a good perspective for you to talk about weighing the risks and the benefits, which is what we do for everything. And if the, risks is ver- if the risk is very low, 
then the need for evidence is also a little bit lower if there's a potential upside. And that seems like one of those circumstances. And yeah, yeah. It, it was a sort of a whirlwind tour through the, through the fasting, through longevity, through cancer, through fertility. And it all tends to have a common theme, doesn't it? Yeah. And yeah. this is the, the thing is that we look at the, um, and I went over this in the diabetes code, is that if you look at the five sort of uh, things that uh, deal with uh, metabolic syndrome, so the waist circumference and the type 2 diabetes, the hypertriglycerides, low HDL and hypertension, they're actually all linked to hyperinsulinemia. But there's actually so much more to it because it's like, after the metabolic syndrome, you got obesity linked, I think, mechanistically really to hyperinsulinemia, type 2 diabetes linked to hyperinsulinemia, PCOS like linked to hyperinsulinemia, um, but also things like cancer where it may play a, not a, a sort of causative role, but a sort of facilitative role. I mean, you're talking about the biggest killers in America. So heart, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, cancer are sort of like at least four of the top five. Right. And all of them are impacted by hyperinsulinemia. And I think that's a better term than insulin resistance because it immediately tells you what you need to do. So insulin resistance doesn't tell you what you need ah, to do. Good point. So if you say, I have insulin resistance, then people will say, well, what caused it? And then there's all this debate. Oh, maybe it's a high fat diet caused insulin resistance, right? I don't think so. But if you say now that the problem is hyperinsulinemia, then you say, okay, well, I have too much insulin, bring it down. And then right. it's like, well, it seems pretty obvious how you're going to bring it down, right? Uh, cut the carbs and don't eat, right? Yeah. It, 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 so, so it's a much more powerful. So, so just changing that word makes it so much more powerfully clear to people what you're supposed to do because there's been a shift in medicine, right? If you look at the causes of death, there's a, a complete shift from sort of a hundred years ago when you're talking Trauma, tuberculosis, infection, exactly, yeah. infections and diarrhea, and, right. you know, that sort of thing. To what are now, you know, well, the top two sort of, if you look at the, the cause of death, there's two and then there's everything else. So heart disease and cancer are just off the scale in terms of the amount of people they kill. And then everything else is actually quite a bit lower than that. So if, and those are diseases which are going to be impacted by metabolic syndrome. And also we know cancer, like, so for so many years, we just thought about it as a genetic disease. It's like, but what about the genetics when you put it in a high growth environment which is a high nutrient environment, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, okay, well, you know that cancer, you go back to sort of, um, you know, those traditional African societies and stuff. They had cancer, right? But they had, yeah. a lot of them were viral cancers, Burkitt's lymphoma and so on. But those cancers like breast cancer and stuff, they practically didn't exist. So the Eskimo or the Inuit that we call them now, so in the far north of Canada, they actually studied them uh, very intensively to see why they were immune to cancer. Okay, immune. <laughs> They're immune to cancer, right? except for EBV. They got nasopharyngeal carcinoma and stuff, but they didn't get breast cancer. They didn't get colorectal cancer. Interesting. And then, of course, we took them away from their traditional lifestyle of hunting and gathering, and gave them white bread and you know seed oils and sugar, and all of a sudden, cancer just goes way way, way up. Yeah. So we pretend that cancer is this disease of all genetics, 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 but it's not because two of the sort of, okay, if you talk about the big three cancers, lung cancer, obviously is just, it's smoking, right? That's, let's forget that. So the next two are breast cancer and colorectal cancer. Prostate cancer is number four. It's actually very common, but it actually doesn't kill as many people because it's mostly slow growing. Um, and it doesn't affect the sort of younger age groups as, as much. But so breast cancer, colorectal cancer, which we've already declared are obesity related uh, cancers. So it's like, let's face the fact that these are actually diseases that may have something to do with insulin and reducing a state of hyperinsulinemia might be highly beneficial for them. And again, yeah. what's the downside? What's the risk? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So when done safely, and that's the key, when done safely, when fasting, 
with low carb nutrition when done safely can make a big impact with very little downside. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, that was a great, a great summary and a great discussion of all that. So thank you very much uh, for taking the time. Thank Give you. us a little hint. What's next for you and where can people learn more about you to hear more? Uh, yeah, so they can go to our uh, website, which is idmprogram.com, which stands for Intensive Dietary Management. Um, and there's uh, lots of resources, a lot of free resources and paid resources if, if you want more. Um, you can go on Twitter. Um, I'm usually fairly active there. I've got the books. Um, you know, next up, we've got some, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book about um, PCOS, which is sort of a, you know, about what we talked about. And also, and I'm doing that with Nadia, and then also um, a cancer book as well, just talking about sort of, it's it's not like a how to cure cancer, because that's not going to happen. Um, but it's sort of this, you know, I'm really, really fascinated because the whole story of cancer has changed so completely from what we thought it was. Mm. So we thought it was just a bunch of randomly accumulated genetic mutations. And from sort of 1990-ish, you know, when I went into medical school, 1992, to sort of 2010 probably, it was all considered genetic mutations. But now the whole, the whole theory of what cancer is has completely changed. And now we're talking about evolution, using evolutionary biology uh, in trying to understand how cancers develop. And we're trying, talking about, you know, one of the really fascinating things about cancer is why it occurs in every single cell in the body. Like almost every cell in the body can become cancerous. And that's really weird. Mm. And it's not just that, but almost every single multicellular animal in existence can develop cancer. So even a hydra, which is one of the most primitive multicellular organisms, can develop cancer. So cancer is not a disease of just humans. It actually predates humanity by a lot. It's a much, much more ancient than disease than we knew. Hmm. And it actually probably dates back to the transition between unicellularity and multicellularity, which is, you know, what is, and that's really what the fascinating story of cancer really is. And that's, yeah. that's I mean, what that I'm, almost speaks against insulin resistance um, as being a contributor. So I, I think it's, it's more complicated than, than it's just definitely the more thing. complicated. Yeah. But but the insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia is going to play a, a um, sort of uh, facilitative role. That right. is, it's going to make. It's not going to cause cancer. Yeah, but I think that's the, the important cancer, differentiation. Yeah, exactly. If the cancer is there, it's going to make it grow faster. Yeah. And that's the difference. Say you take a Japanese woman in Japan, she may get breast cancer, but you put them in a high nutrient environment, which is a high growth environment. That is, give her lots of, you know, bread and insulin goes way up and mTOR goes way up. Well, you know, all of a sudden that breast cancer, which wasn't a problem back then, or you take mm. a look at the Inui, for example, like they clearly have the potential to develop cancer, but they're keeping insulin so low, for example, that those cells never get yeah. the growth environment signaling matters. Pathway. Exactly. It's the environment mm. that matters. But then you put them in, you give them, uh, you know, fry bread, which is basically like white bread fried in oil. Uh, that's what they eat. Great. <laughs> um, now you get them in a high growth environment. Now those cells that would not have grown do grow. And that's when you start to see cancer. So we go from a time where we consider the Inui completely immune to cancer, these people don't get cancer ever, to, hey, they get a lot of cancer over here, right? Yeah. And, 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 and it's because of the environment. It's not because of the genetics. So that that is the story, sort of story of cancer. So it's, a, it's, it's not purely just about, um, you know, fasting and so on. It's actually, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more interested in the sort of deeper story, which is changing. And I don't think it's the end of the, you know, I don't think that's the final answer. I think actually there's just so much more to, to be learned about it, but it's just a very interesting as we move from that transition from uh, a, a paradigm of pure genetics 
to a paradigm of evolutionary biology, which is to me a much more fascinating uh, yeah. thing. In interesting structure change for sure. Well, thank you. Thank you for all your, your uh, information and all you're doing online and all you're doing to help people and, and promote the idea that insulin matters and environment matters. So it's wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you.